kids on new trials and stammer paper flame. And the white girls love me. And the haters shove me and push me until I beat the pussy up like it was ugly. And that's what I'll the loot. Niggas take the time to tune the diamond dollars. Bitch, I'm complex like I stop being skilled. Look, I'm the truth, now stop daring me. Hello. Good afternoon and uh, welcome to Sunday Sessions with Francis Stark, Complex Education, which takes place in conjunction with Mike Kelly. Uh, today's event was organized by the curator, writer and art historian Linda Norden, who will give you um, a little introduction on Francis Stark and why Francis is here today. Thank you for coming. Um. Frances Stark, as most of you probably know, is a Los Angeles-based artist. She's also a much-loved teacher whose understanding of education is as complex and radically deviant as her art. And she was a student of Mike Kelly, a relationship that remains seminal to her art and is one reason she's here to pay homage today. Stark's work has always been deeply rooted in language, music, and literature, or rather in the capacity of language, music, and art and literature to transmit something legible from one individual to another, which she seems to know is usually most powerful when the transmission is coded and the codes are recognized. Lately, Stark's interest seems to have shifted from the language of literature and her imagining of the voices of authors she's drawn to to what she's described as the straight-up legibility of daily life and the myriad little events that communicate reception and intimacies. More complicatedly, Stark has pursued real people who communicate their interest in her art, often online or in her words, has brazenly pursued unlikely alliances with men totally outside the realm of my presumed audience or student demographics, who go on to make real, ma mater real material contributions to her work. In that more recent work, Stark has also used videos to exploit the contradictions of real-time exchanges between virtually projected personae and worlds, willfully toying with the peculiar intimacies and risks shared online, pushing virtual exchanges over and into real-life encounters, and exploring the slippery business of trust. My best thing, her breakout work in this vein, played at MoMA here, PS1, from October through July in 2012. Bobby Jesus' alma mater, black, white, reading the Book of David and or paying attention is free. Stark's newest video, which is on view now at the Carnegie International in Pittsburgh, features, among other things, iconic portraits of Tupac, Ice Cube, Dr. Dre, and Biggie, as well as portraits of Stark and her son. It's also got a panoply of works of, of artworks arrayed over a trippy perspectival checkerboard down below, a kind of predella to the video above. The new video shifts its attention to learning, living, and uh, life, the better part of education, which Stark makes clear is both complex and corrupted by institutional emphasis on results the cycle of consumption and production, and the cycle of consumption and production fortified it by co-opted funding. Over time, what's held me in thrall of her art is the mix of brazenness and bravery it requires. Stark's art is chock full of hungry ego, but like her teacher, Mike Kelly, she's also deeply angry at institutions and profoundly humbled by the lives of others, and not afraid to embarrass herself in the service of something a lot bigger than any single ego, and show herself off in all kinds of great ways. Bobby Jesus, paying attention to free, is free, is in part an homage to a high school friend who took the iconic and personal portraits it features but also tragically took his own life in 2009. And Stark notes in her acknowledgement for the project how moved she's always been by his fearlessness and romantic idealism. The extent to which she's determined to pursue that fearlessness and, uh, and romantic idealism herself, as well as Kelly's darker pursuit of something comparable but angrier without following their endings is what I think this presentation she's put together today is about. Because I'm going to start with a difficult bit. Um, 
Well, actually, Linda did a lot of work for me. I didn't know she was going to do that. So, um, in this oh, bit here, you see Baldazar is quoted and saying he was, he was the best, a bit like Jesus, I've been thinking. And I've been thinking a lot about Jesus, too, and not in a religious way, necessarily. Um, but uh, I, the whole full title of the piece that, that Linda referred to is this. The BW actually stands for backed with, which is what a term used on vinyl for A side, B side. Um, so I'm going to show you a little bit of the video, but not the whole thing, because it doesn't really translate in the context. Because um, the images that are on this wall are actually on the wall, and they're not in the video itself. But you'll see when I show you. And, um, and Linda also mentioned the photographs, the iconic photographs, which I'll show you. And, this is Veronica, true icon. And um, so I'm thinking a lot about, <laughs> a lot about icon, uh, iconic imagery. And yeah, <laughs> I'm just going to show you some pictures. Here's my friend, Sean Mortensen, who's the photographer that she mentioned. And um, in his book, Out of Mind, um, it just so happens that there's a portrait of Mike doing a performance with, and then on the other side of the page is um, Tupac. So these are the, some of the images that appear in the Bobby Jesus um, work, and I'm sure you're familiar with these. <laughs> Do you hear that? <laughs> I'll just go through. Um, yeah, do I even need to say who they are? Um, so, but you know, he also took pictures of me and my son. And um, that's me. Actually, that was t picture was taken um, while OJ was being pursued in his Bronco. Literally, it was happening while we were shooting that. Um, and then, this is my son, and um, that's obviously taken much later. And um, they didn't make it into the book, but <laughs> um, of course we didn't. But um, <laughs> the the I just the reason why it's significant is because this person touched my life and the, that I'm, what I'm going to talk about today is essentially about influences um, as well as talking about pedagogy which is pretty much intertwined but um, the, the, the investigation into the sort of the iconic imagery and into thug life in particular, which is a kind of major theme here, um, is, is based on the fact that my boy that I made is a major target sort of audience for contemporary mainstream hip hop. And we all know that there's like a massive strand of that. I mean, it's impossible to disconnect that from the history. And so there's a really complex thing going on, me bringing up a boy and sort of dealing with what that, nego negotiating those influences. And, um, but the fact that somehow, you know, he touched our lives and then he created this sort of iconic, the photographer that is, created these iconic images as a kind of key I don't know, motivator on a certain level for me. Um, this was the image we ended up, the reason why I did the photo shoot with him was because I was doing a, a exhibition in, um, in LA that was curated by Dennis Cooper 
and I had made a CD and uh, Mike helped me mix it and this was that's what it looked like and then that's a later for a portrait of me um, by Sean as well and then one of the main voices in the in the little pamphlets that I refer to is a uh, a Jesuit priest named Father Gregory Boyle, also known as Father G, who is the head of a, something called Homeboy Industries in Los Angeles, which, um, you know, is a massive operation that basically rehabilitates gang members, but through very practical ways. And Father G is like a, like a kind of celebrity, like a kind of saint in in East LA really and Bobby who is in my work who you will meet um, he you know he was had his first job working for Father G when he was like 12 um, so this is a quote from Father G and then the bit in the sharpie that's Mother F and I'm Mother F uh, if our primary goal is results, we will choose only to work with those who give us good ones. You stand with the belligerent, the surly, and the badly behaved until bad behavior is recognized for the language it is. The vocabulary of the deeply wounded and of those whose burdens are more than they can bear. Jesus jostled irreparably with the purity code of the shock collars of his day. He recognized that it was precisely this code that kept folks from kinship. Maybe success has become the new purity code, and Jesus shows us that the desire for purity, nine times out of ten, is in fact the enemy of the gospel. That's uh, some kind of success story right there. <laughs> the resurrection. And then I have my own version of thug life. Um, I can't work out the acronym yet, but, but you know that, that nobody seems to believe me lately, but Tupac actually, Thug Life was supposed to also stand for the hate you give little infants fucks everyone. Okay, so Mike. So Mike is a model for me in a big way, and I went to go see him give an artist talk, which is the primary sort of motor of any art school, basically. That's like a massive component of the curriculum, as we all know. I went to go see him give an artist talk at the Art Institute. I was not attending that school. Um, and he spoke about this work here. This is a mural that is in the Art Institute gallery, and it's by Diego Rivera. And if you look closely, you can see his ass is right in the middle of the mural. And it is um, the making of a fresco showing the building of a city. So seeing Mike and on stage and giving his whole presentation, that was, was 1990 or something, I, I, was, I, I don't think I had ever, I, I didn't study art, so I wasn't used to going to see art lectures, but there was something about what he embodied that connected with me, with my history as being like a punk rocker and kind of do-it-yourself and like raw and rah, he seemed like a rock star basically, and but like insanely intelligent and also the work had to do with class issues that that kind of came up for me, you know, I, I just basically he. I wanted to go study with him, and that's why I went to Art Center. And so I applied for Art Center with this couple of these or two things I applied with. The piece on the right is my, because I didn't study art, I knew, but I did Page Maker. <laughs> and, uh, I, and so I copied Joseph Kasuth. But, but if you read this, I don't want to read it out loud. If you read it, I think it's pretty uh, apropos a lot of the issues that are in the work, in my work now, in the My Best Thing, that have to do with a sort of conflation of power and desire and desirability. And, and, um, 
And this piece was in my um, application, but I did not shoot that photograph. That's me in the photo. I didn't even plan the photograph. It's called Total Performance. The rumor is that Mike said, if she looks like that, let her in. But I don't know if that's true, but it's a good story. But the real story behind it is that I actually raced that motorcycle and I actually got a land speed record, for real. I know that's in some literature somewhere. A new book about an artist who gets a land speed record. I actually got one. <laughs> just rub that in for a second. And now, somehow, miraculously, I became a professor. <laughs> and that's Bobby. So we gotta speed it up a little bit. And then, you know, life and death. <laughs> um, I, I'm just gonna show a few little snippets of some work on paper. Uh, because I did, I did a show last year, and it was called Memento Mori, which, you know, remember your mortality, remember you will die. Um, and there was some mic stuff in it, and I, I, I was thinking a lot about kind of archiving and um, kind of like, you're, if you go away, you know, someone's got to take care of your shit, so better you start sorting it now, you know? And so, but just so there was kind of some things in there like this is my thesis uh, that Mike signed off on it's called heavy petting a parapraxis in defense of the adoration of my own poetics and then the rest of the title is totally pompous and stupid and then the the um, then there's like a list of the little CD mix that Mike helped me make um, fuck the world is the first one. It's, it's, it's me on bass, la 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 la. Anyway, so. Um, here's another drawing of the detail. So this is a little print I made where I'm parsing out the sentence. And so I kind of, that's a sort of nod to him and how he kind of so explicitly incorporated really like direct class issues into his work. Um, and then also, as a, in the capacity of professor at the University of Southern California, I, I organized a symposium on the future of art school. And now we're in that future, and uh, maybe I'll mention a few things about that. And then another thing I wanted to say that is, is um, you just kind of, I don't know, this is just sad, I guess. But it's just that the last, I just, I, ah, I'm not going to forget it. Forget that. It's too sad. Um, so where did I come from? Um, I'm just going to, I'm just selecting like four basic kind of tracks, two which are very connected. Um, from Mike, you know, what he brought into studio visits or brought into um, school at Art Center in Pasadena in the early 90s. And I just, it's funny, there are no visual art references up there. But the, um, Thomas Bernhardt, um, a film called The Baby, uh, Sun Ra and Iggy Pop. Um, in terms of Thomas Bernhardt, the, there's a whole discussion of Thomas Bernhardt's The Loser in My Best Thing. Um, what I have up here is not Thomas Bernhardt, but it's Lydia Davis, who is uh, like a big fan of his, and I think she's a lot like him, but she's like a female version in an American way, and I really like her. I want to read this to you. I think I know what sort of person I am, but then I think, 
But this stranger will imagine me quite otherwise when he or she hears this or that to my credit. For instance, that I have a position at the university. The fact that I have a position at the university will appear to mean that I must be the sort of person who has a position at the university. But then I have to admit with surprise that, after all, it is true that I have a position at the university. I, I actually got tenure. We'll just, just, yeah, we'll talk about that later. And if it is true, then perhaps I really am the sort of person you imagine when you, be when you hear that a person has a position at the university. But on the other hand, I know I am not the sort of person I imagine when I hear that a person has a position at the university. Then I see what the problem is when others describe me this way. They appear to describe me completely, whereas in fact, they do not describe me completely. And a complete description of me would include truths that seem quite incompatible with the fact that I have a position at the university. Um, trash picker. That's Mike. It says, I am useless to the culture, but God loves me. And this is me in my drawing class with uh, Brandon and Bobby. Um, they never went to college, or, well, they went to other colleges. That's called college. Um, uh, and they were models for my students at USC. And I teach a drawing class, and in the drawing class, all of the slides that you saw in the beginning um, which was a show that I curated at the Hammer, just looking through their collection and basically just drawing out from their collection what appealed to me and sort of chore uh, making a composition with that selection. I, I used that for my drawing students um, and as a tool, as a, as a learning tool, and I used it for several semesters. Um, and it's very explicitly sexual and stuff, and I was always very surprised how they didn't catch on to that very quickly. They didn't catch on to a lot very quickly. I love them, but they're not getting the best education out there. Just contemplate the image. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I planned that one, that was perfect. <laughs> okay, so so the baby. So 1974, I just had to get the Sigmar Polka painting in there as a time marker. It just, before the baby, the baby. Um, that's Polka, though. Um, so Mike, I was a TA, and I, I was in this position where I had to, you know, order films and blah, blah, blah. We, he wanted to invite the director of this film um, to speak. And um, as many of you know, if you did go to art school, 
or graduate school, one of the things that you do is you pick people up from the airport and drive them around. And that's like a massive part of your education. Like for example, so most, I would usually do that with people like Lynn Tillman, brilliant, had the best time, blah, 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 blah. You learn something every 30 seconds. Well, this guy was not like an artist. He was a, f a he, um, <laughs> Ted Post. <laughs> he lived in Brentwood and um, he was not proud of the baby. He was only a for hire director. So he was very proud of what he did do, which was Cagney and Lacey. So that was his baby. But he didn't like the baby. And he was really ashamed. And he was sort of, I just, he was not super happy about what was happening or not very clear. And what made it worse is that I went out to pick him up in Brentwood in my little mini truck over by the Getty. And, be, and, and to get to Art Center, well, we were on the Pasadena Freeway and I got a flat tire in Highland Park. And he was very nervous about that. And Highland Park is where Mike's studio was when I was a student. And Highland Park is where I met Bobby and Brandon and Highland Park is where I could buy some drugs if I want, no, whatever. It's my neighborhood, it's right, yeah, you know, you've probably all been there if you've been to LA. But it, this is the 90s, you know, it was a little more charged and a little more awkward for him to be in that situation. Anyway, so the driver, <laughs> I was a driver also after graduating with Sharon for Sigmar Polka. Well, that's why I had the polka paint. Um, and we drove around, and here is like, here, I think it's like, Ira, you're all, like, you all are in one soup. And then, here I have a picture, I'm sorry, Hope, but it's so cute. <laughs> I have a picture of Hope getting out of the car. I was also in that car. I wasn't driving it, though. Delmer was driving it, and we made friends on the ride home because we were lost, and I never shut up about DJ Quick. And we had this whole big conversation. And he was like, you need to listen to John Coltrane and stop smoking so much pot. Anyway, we, he was cool and we had uh, exchanged some emails. And I wanted to share them. But you, can, you can't really see him in the slide, but you know, he's in there on the, in the car. And uh, yeah, blah, blah, blah. Interesting coincidence. Everything is an interesting coincidence with me. I'm sparing you many of them, but, um, so he's telling me, oh, so yeah, interesting coincidence to open your email about the Tupac documentary when this is what my computer desktop looks like. I'm like a screenshot freak, so everything I have to take a picture of, I showed it to Delmer, Tupac, and Quick. Um, so, and at the same time, one of my two parakeets just flew out the front door after a year of living outside the cage and never trying to escape. His name was Baby. Everything has a potential to be symbolic. Okay, and so Delmer writes back. But before I tell you about Delmer writing back, this baby is Bobby's cousin. And Bobby's cousins were trying to figure out what to name their baby, and they asked him for baby name suggestion. And Bobby is a huge fan of Gavin, and so he suggested Gavin. And that baby is Gavin. <laughs> and, but it gets bad. The dad of Gavin threw the mother of Gavin out the fucking window. And now she's paralyzed. And he took off. So, the other <laughs> Gavin. But I think he'll, you know, he, we're gonna pull through because they got a good big family. Anyway, Delmer writes me, I was at a school named Ola with emotionally disturbed learning disabled children from the wealthy to the poor. The com commonality was parental abuse, neglect. I retired when I did because we were seeing more and more kids born in blah, 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 blah. 
then it got to the point where the adults were worse than the kids and, you know, whatever. So, like what Linda was saying about the babies and the stuffed animals, it's like, I, I feel like I, as I kind of sort of looking through all my images that I collect and all these little babies and kids, that they are the sort of like the real analog to the sort of, you know, that kind of totemic, like so soiled, uh, you know, stuffed animal of, uh, in the vocabulary of Mike's work. So the baby, the movie, um, is a story of a mother, single mother, of course, and she has two daughters by different fathers and a boy who's actually a man, but he, they keep him in a crib. So, and of course the sisters are very sexy. <laughs> um, and it's really a battle between the single mother and her two daughters and the social worker. And the social worker has a thing for baby and she has her own devices on baby. And um, at a certain point, she ends up stealing baby from his family. Um, and then she snaps this, she goes to snap a photo of him dressed up as a, you know, in a suit, like, look, he's really making progress. See what I can do to your baby? I can help him better. Okay, so um, baby's checking out <laughs> her ass, maybe, I'm not sure. I, that's just Bobby as a baby, and I don't know, that's kind of out of sequence. And that's Bobby as a grown-up. And that's Fishley and Vice, pot, baby. Um, I don't know if I'm going to be able to read this, but uh, it's essentially, it's an essay about my work, but it talks about infinite jest and how, oh man, Oh, 20 years in the, in the age of digital communication. Um, oh my God. Um, it's basically about how the internet came from the military industrial complex and la 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 and talks about Infinite Jest, the film within the novel that is a, something that essentially makes you turn into an infant and you can't stop looking at you can't stop looking at what you're looking at, the entertainment. Here's some babies. That says unnamed. That baby's unnamed. The baby on the left is Francis, and the baby on the right is named Dior. And this says, it gets bigger as you get bigger. And that says, USC Trojans. That's our baby mascot. This is actually in my studio. I didn't, couldn't believe what was happening there. Um, okay, so we've had the babies. Uh, the next little sort of bit about what Mike brought to, you know, from his own history or whatever, a lot into school, uh, is is this the, the kind of Detroit um, heritage or whatever? His his being from Detroit and what that's about. Here, Kelly attended Catholic schools until 1968 when he enrolled in a public high school. The race riots that devastated downtown Detroit in '67. Um, blah, 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 blah. He was fleetingly involved with the White Panthers, a hippie group um, modeled on the Black Panthers, which was born in Detroit, 
um, in the wake of the race riots. Um, da, 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 da. So yes, Mike Kelly was briefly involved with the White Panthers. They just called themselves the, the White Niggas. You know, so I mean, they were really gone. You got the jams, motherfucker. Yeah, so the White Panthers were essentially MC5's manager, John Sinclair, MC5, da 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 da. It was a, um, and they had a full, number one, full endorsement and support of Black Panther Party's 10, ten point program. Number two, total assault on the culture by any means necessary, including rock and roll, something, and fucking in the street. Dope, yeah, and fucking in the streets. And then Sun Ra. So that's uh, the singer from MC5 and Angela Davis. I did not realize they were so similar. <laughs> okay, now we're sort of moving back to the Carnegie. Um, uh, when I installed the piece in the Carnegie, um, it was really crazy because there, I have my slides out of order, so I have to tell you this. Um, across from my sort of checkerboard, you look through this hallway, and the right centered in the hallway was a painting by Henry Taylor. Um, not that. It, uh, boy, it is. Here's me and Henry. This is. Um, Devron and Henry, who was par participating in the Carnegie and the Braddock uh, Library Project from Transformasium. Um, we wanted a picture together. We didn't have one. We just had each other with Henry, so we came up with that. It's a Henry Taylor painting. And then back to the baby. Let's just contemplate this image for a minute. Here's the painting that you could see. This is an image from after the riots in Detroit in 1967. That's the year I was born. Um, that's also an image from the riots in 67. The f image on the right, it says, die, vicious beast, die by the spear. That's from the magic flute, um, the Ingmar Bergman film version. This is a little like shaggy area here that <laughs> I have some problems. But you know, these are just kind of things to contemplate and, and um, rhymes, I guess. That's garbage bag from Mike Kelly. This is from my work called I Went Through My Bin. Let's talk about disobeying. Um, this is a, my son, Arlo Stark Hansen. It says there, talk to parents. He had a lighter at school which depicted copulation. That's double duty right there. <laughs> the, the, the thing is, I, he, he per, it was a purloined item. Um, it's actually a sentimental item that was given to me by my best friend when I was in college who um, OD'd and died when she was 21. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about pay for your pleasure, not so specifically, but um, oh, partially because there's a, in the, in the book Catholic Tastes, there's an excellent text to read. It was so great to go back and read this text. It was written by Dennis Cooper and um, Casey McKinney. And I happened to be in a writing class outside of school and at the time with Dennis Cooper. Um, uh, and Casey was, you know, like a little druggy kid, and 
Dennis really admired him and really meant, you know, had a big role mentoring him and Mike was sort of cool enough to let Dennis write the text with this kind of messed up kind of brilliant little drugged out guy. He's now a whatever editor and great grown up whatever but but um, with kids. <laughs> anyway, the um, the piece itself is you know the piece, you've walked through the piece. That was like a really crucial uh, work for me um, when I first started, you know, started getting into Mike and going, moving to back down to LA to go to school. Um, I'm not gonna read these, but. Um, My studio is um, right, this is the parking lot of my studio, not the book. Um, and what you see is it's called the Twin Towers. And that's, um, a lot of these images are in here because they're culled from the video that I showed you. The, it's called the Twin Towers, it's the LA County Jail. And I have a view of it every day when I come to work and leave work. So I think about that a lot and think about my own freedom and what I can do and what other people can't do. And it's, um, this is my, this is Bobby with my son and his two pals that live down up the street from us. And he's actually spray painting Lolo, which is nickname Wigga. It was not, <laughs> I, I don't condone it. I didn't get involved. <laughs> um, Ah, this is this isn't talk for another time. Um, but I guess the, one of the things that Linda brought up was about the fierce rage at institutions. I've done a lot of work trying to calm myself down, so I, I'm a little bit angry at my school. I mean, I'm a very angry at my school, and the reason is very complex. Um, but essentially. A freak, you know, we essentially the news, and this is just the straight up good news from the school. On a sunny day in May, USC announced an extraordinarily generous and exceptionally visionary gift from pioneering music producer Jimmy Iovine and ah, big art, whatever, celebrated, oh, celebrated artist Andre Young, who is known professionally as Dr. Dre. Their 70 million gift will create something, something. The business of innovation, something, something, something. So essentially, we got a massive gift that came out of Beats by Dre money to make a new art school. Um, but we don't have an art. <laughs> we, don't, we don't have anything to really build that into something significant, in my opinion. And, um, and it's a complicated story, and I'm going to talk about it in really ugly, disgusting detail soon, and I will be sure to invite you all to hear that. <laughs> That's at the end of Pay for Your Pleasure. Um, I don't know what painting is. I mean, I didn't see the painting yet of what is in there, but I know it's a sort of local killer. That's a John Wayne Gacy. Do you know that Jorge Pardo grew up when this was happening? And um, he actually knew a lot of kids from his homeroom. I mean, this was like a real threat for Jorge. We did a roast once, and, and one of the jokes was like, Jorge's only alive today because he wouldn't fit under John Wayne Gacy's floorboards. It wasn't my joke. My joke was meaner. I'll tell you later. It's about he and Laura Owens were dating. <laughs> How much time do I have? No, um, I, it was they had just broken up. And so, and so it was like, oh, you know, have you seen Jorge's looking pretty good? You know, he lost about. 10 pounds recently, but Laura looks amazing. She lost over 300 pounds. <laughs> I actually
actually made that joke up. Um, wait, do we re refresh your memory where we are here? Um, that's a George Bush painting, and that's a George Zimmerman painting. And yeah, and that's OJ's jersey, which used to be on display at USC, but is no longer. And that's Christopher Dorner, the cop who went on a rampage. Nobody knows. Um, bitches ain't shit. You've heard that before. It's from a Dre thing. And this is DJ Quick. He did the music to the piece, the Carnegie piece that I showed you. He didn't do it for me. I used his music. Um, we had a very intense, I had an intense attempt to kind of get him on board and I really wanted to do something with him and collaborate, but <laughs> bitches ain't shit. So, uh, <laughs> you know, and uh, I'm useless to my culture, but God loves me. And that's the shit, y'all. That's my... Um, this is... The, this is a uh, from my from the bunch of images that I showed on the checkerboard. Puta madre, Spanish slang. Puta means roughly fuck or bitch, and madre means mother. The two words together become a common expletive meaning holy shit or motherfucker. Um, in the north of Spain, if you add the article. When the article la is added to the beginning of the phrase la puta madre, it becomes a high compliment, meaning that something is the whatever, the best, the shit. Okay. Then there's two examples. Professor, class, I have a surprise for you. There is a test today. Uh, uh, student, ah, uh, <laughs> that mother puta madre. Right, and then it's like, class, I have a surprise for you. No more exams, ever. Ah, eres la puta madre. <laughs> and there's an air ad for airsoft because my son is online looking for airsoft guns. So that shit pops up. And there they are. Well, hers is a cap gun, he's got an airsoft. They're about to attack me. Oh, here's something that really spells it out. The USC Ivine and Young Academy for Arts, Technology, and the Business of Innovation seeks innovators, entrepreneurs, creators, and disruptors who question the status quo and wish to use their skills and abilities to initiate positive and groundbreaking solutions to virtually any problem. This elite Bachelor of Science program enrolls its first cohort of 25 in fall 2014. Um, the image on the right is uh, Geo Group. You know who they are? They are the biggest for-profit prison corporation. And they gave money for the stadium at Florida. State, Florida Atlantic University, I mean and they wanted to put their name on the stadium. Just contemplate that image for a second. So, <laughs> I really raced through here. Um, the, the, this is Bobby on the airplane going to the Carnegie, his second ever ride on an airplane. And that was really exciting for him. Um, he's reading John Berger's Ways of Seeing. He really is my student in so many ways, not in any kind of institutional way at all. Um, on the right are some Crips, <laughs> one of whom I know by freak chance, he stumbled in down in front of my studio. He wasn't stumbling. He what? Uh, he was looking for a liquor store. He said, but I thought DJ Quick sent him to kill me. But I, he's a crip. 
blood. I don't think, I don't know. But anyway, I invited him into my studio while I was making this work, and Bobby, we were all talking, and we got along, and la la la, and then we were Instagram friends, whatever. And we have had multiple conversations about many, many things, and, and he's a real, you know, he just got out of prison for five years. And um, anyway, I just, he just posted this, and I thought it was the most amazing image, and um, I like the ass. I, for, there was a picture of my ass, like, bending over. I, I, for, I think I took it out, but I could do that now if you want. But I wanted to end on that, but I don't want to end on that because I wanted to end on this. I'm not going to end on this, though, because I'm going to play you a little video. But um, I have an Instagram friend that I've never met, Uncle Socks, and I showed him this picture, and this is his response. So, should I read it for those of you who can't see? Fuck both of those roads. Be the house that holds the bird that flies or break it. Okay, so I'm gonna show you. Um, we have, I really, we have some, a lot of time, I think. So I'm gonna show you this video, that, which is still just a portion. And then we can, we'll see what happens after that. Shall we really give up hope? <laughs> Hurry up with chains and rope. That's from the magic flute. Um, well, that's my slideshow. Well, we have a lot of time, and um, I didn't really want to do question and answers, because you know how that can get a little bit like, Whoa. So, but I've, maybe I could pick on some people who I know would ask a really good question. <laughs> Or my plants. Um, yeah, is that Ron Dean? No. <laughs> I just wanted to say hi. hi. Is it? Hi. I'm not high. Hi. Okay. Okay. Then comments, questions. Cancel. <laughs> okay. A lot more check. Yeah, yeah, I do. I have a lot. I have a lot of. I have a lot more pictures. A lot, a lot more pictures. Mm-hmm. Oh, I like hearing my voice in the microphone. How you doing, guys? Um, so, that picture right there depicts your journey, or what does it depict? Um, well, it doesn't. What happens is when you're in the room with it, you can in encounter. You go up and you can look at them. 
you can't see them from where you're sitting. It's not a very good way to encounter it, but when you walk up, you see rhymes with images. You see front and back. You see babies' heads. You see a head. You see Goliath's head. You see, you know, my ass in the middle. Right under the very tip is the um, um, the Diego Rivera mural. So that's the sort of house, and it's talking about you know the building of the city. But you see the artist right in the middle, and you see his ass, and you see my ass. You see a path. You know, so you essentially. Um, what it depicts is what's each image has its own autonomy and it is not stylized or painted or translated anyway it just kind of is what it is off the internet or off a piece of paper in my studio and so what it depicts is a bunch of images and and when you start to work through them you start to see kind of associations and and um, like with Bobby and Mary Magdalene for example they look alike they're paired a lot or with um, um, uh, let's see uh, and Bobby and Agnes Martin also look a lot alike in some pics which is really weird um, there's a lot of heads coming out of vaginas and um, there's a uh, Matisse in the studio drawing a naked lady. Um, there's David holding the head of Goliath, but in front of that is a still from Mark Leckie, um, the long tail, where he's drawing a diagram of the of the long tail, which shows a head and the tail, and so the head of Goliath, the Philistine, is essentially superimposed. So, so ultimately, it's just depicting what you want it to be, like, just whatever you want it to be. Well, no, it's not whatever I want. It's basically topics that have to do, because if you remember in the clip that I showed at the beginning, it's like, you know, I teach at University of Southern California, Bobby went to University of South Central, la la la, our paths cross. It's about paths crossing, and it's about a sort of encounters that kind of produce like insights or experiences that kind of like uh, um, reveal thing, you know, just that produce stories, first of all. So all, most of these um, images, they have Don Quixote, so there's about idealism. There's a picture of a kind of conquistador who is um, like stabbing two natives and then right above it there's a picture where the there's two guys above blood and a crypt fighting each other um and they're almost in the exact sort of like location and position as the native in the that are getting like stabbed by the conquistadors but in that one there's no conquistador so you know there's a weird you know there's a trojan horse there's the Colosseum, there's Christians being burned in the Colosseum. The Colosseum is also the name of the stadium where the USC football team plays. Um, um, there's, there's rhymes, there's like the three homies getting arrested with the three witches are sort of binary. There's a sword swallower. She's, uh, there's a, is it Corbet, the origin of the universe? Um, yeah, I mean, so, when you're in it, and I've had the experience with people in the show, like they really do just speak themselves. Like the images are very direct. They're not aestheticized or ultra stylized to kind of like disappear into a background of a pattern. They they're just really legible for what they are, and so you can kind of flow through and make the associations. And because they're part of my film but they're not locked in the linearity of the film you can always access them and this is the beauty of projecting onto the wall like if you were going to have a fit like you can't see like all of the te there's text on there that's like 12 point font if you're in a room and you walk up to it you could read it perfectly fine but if that was in a movie you couldn't read a text and then see a big long shot at the same time so there's this thing about being able to really like examine things closely. More Jorge jokes? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Jorge also went to Art Center.
I have a, I have other videos. Why did Bobby go to the Carnegie show? Why did he go? Yeah. Well, he was so, Bobby and I basically became really close friends, and he was so integral into the development of that piece. And, um, and also, it was the opening happened to fall on his birthday. And so it was a very special thing, and I just thought, you know, this would be a really fantastic opportunity for him to see, like, where this stuff ends up. There's other, um, sort of store um, because one of the posters that we made each poster has like a big the big image on the fold out the sort of center fold and one of the images on the fold on the posters on one of the posters was um, his best friend who was killed when he was 21 or 22 um, and um, and so it was like seeing his homey in the museum, you know, to act for it, it really, it was a big deal, you know, and so that's why he went and... What's his response to that kind of The context? Situation? Yeah. Well, I already told you he's a fan of Gavin. <laughs> so he, I think he, you know, it's not, I think he loves it. He went nuts for Nicole Eisenman and he really, like, ate up the show, you know, like he was really into it. He's very, um, he, the pictures I have of him up here, he's looking hard, but that's when he's like 16. He's actually not a kid, he's 25. And he, um, you know, he also, he, he's, he's not really my apprentice because he only every once in a while does something, you know, very like studio-like. He's really like a kind of, he's like on my crew or something, and he says like, I'm just in the house of Francis. And so he thinks like, he just wants me to be great and he wants me to get better or something. And so it's like he's on my team and he wants to show up. So he's completely invested and fascinated in like the politics of why did this person say that to that? You know, he's, you know, but he doesn't want to get a job at a gallery or anything. You know, that's not his goal. But he does want to open a gallery in the projects. So is there a parallel with his world and you? Yeah. I mean, there, there, there wasn't necessarily. I mean, there is, and I mean, I'm, you know, he, he comes from a, you know, generate, his great-grandmother was like a gangbanger, you know, like this is some deep L.A. stuff. So he has a history in a, in a region, you know, we grew up in the same kind of area, not in the same neighborhood, but we have, we share a kind of regional associations or whatever and as he's become uh, you know more basically a part of my family I've become a part of his family so it's like in the sense of like you're sitting down with the bank robbers and the, you know like really like it's 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 not it's not like I'm over there like taking notes or like oh what did you do you know it's just we're just hanging out and partying or whatever having some barbecue and some beer you know it's not um, it's not really always work. It's just like we really became family and they really respect me and they see, and I think that's a huge part of it is that, or what I feel really like a big accomplishment is like to be able to model the kind of artist, which I feel like, you know, like everything I showed about Mike, it's like Mike is the kind of teacher who brought his like, li like live like intense stuff that really mattered to his work that was in under construction he brought it into the studio he brought it up to you that's the way i teach i'm constantly showing people oh i'm looking at this i'm looking you know like i'm constantly sharing my influences with students and i know it produces good results i mean i know i have a good effect on students for the most part and um and so i my thing with him was essentially like, well, I was getting, I've had a lot of problems at my school, and they're really complicated, and they deserve a two-hour lecture of their own. But one of the things, so as I got more and more frustrated and ready to leave, um, I had, was doing a project where I met Bobby, and, um, and he started hanging around and, like, working on the project, and I realized, like, I'm really modeling a different kind of work ethic. I'm modeling what is a woman, I'm not a bitch, you know sometimes maybe but I um, 
I'm modeling something for him. And I thought, you know, and he's like, oh, what are your students and what do they do? You know, like he went to the undergrad class, but then he discovered the grad studios and it was like, what is this? And so I said, well, this is what they have. They have like a two year Petri dish where they could sort of figure out their shit and become who they are. And, and, and they get a buffer from reality for two years. So I essentially, so I was feeling somehow really flush and I decided, like, I will give you graduate school with me for free, even though you're not even making art or whatever. Like, you can, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to commit to you the way I would commit to, the way I committed to Amanda Ross Ho or a lad Lossry or, I don't know, like, any of my students over the past eight years. Like, I'm going to commit to you. And so, but he doesn't, so he just basically started reading and hanging out the studio and meeting other artists or meet, you know, and, um, and so I, in that experience of offering my, what I always kind of talked about metaphorically as a kind of promiscuity as an artist, it's like when you're already promiscuous sort of intellectually as an artist where it's like, oh, you got an email from someone interesting and you have 50 things you're supposed to do, but this 51st email is the one that gets you wrapped up. You know, like if you, someone titillates you or whatever, you want to get something going and then it's a produ So this is how you continue to produce by like engaging intimately, intellectually with people who have, you have held their interest. And so uh, there's a promiscuity there there's a promiscuity in teaching because you give. I get, well, I don't know. Not everybody maybe teaches this way. This is the only way I know how to do it. And I just like give it. I give it to people. And it's like, I always thought a long time ago, grad school was kind of fucked up. Like, I remember someone wanted to start like a, some free school or not semi free school in Chinatown, not the mountain, but something else. And I was like, well, we want the, and we, this girl, she's going to, I'll give you $200 if you do a studio visit. And it's like, wow, I'm a full-on whore. Like, I'm a full-on, like, I'll give you my head for one hour. What does that cost, you know? And it's like, when you do that all day, whatever, for 10 hours on Wednesdays or something, it's pretty harsh. Anyway, so promiscuity is an issue, and it's something that is a kind of, like, celebratory idea, but also a kind of exhaustion making thing. <laughs> so the promiscuity thing became then a kind of, I sort of, sort of literalized it with the My Best Thing and with all that. And that became a whole other sort of, with the other works that I made with the, with the kind of um, virtual text stuff. Um, and, but, that, but then what happened was that Bobby was like a real kid, like in the world, who then you suddenly see everything very differently and I just, I just automatically have a kind of very maternal instinct and wanted to um, kind of, yeah, like let him be in my school. Like I can give you what I give this person and they're paying for it, you know? And, um, and it's not like the exact same thing or anything, but I think that what happened is a dialogue between other students and him, between me and his friends who actually are gang banging and stuff like that. And so it really opened up like multiple channels of discussion and kinship essentially, because that's really what, that's what we celebrate and that's what matters in the end in, in our sort of grad school experience. And all my complaints about the what's happening at USC. I mean, I, I, I don't, if, if grad school goes away, I don't have a problem with that. I have a problem with like, how do we educate the undergrads? But even more of a problem with the fact that the undergrads are coming in and that most of them are gypped and they don't get any kind of like solid education in high school. So my sort of spirit of radical pedagogy or whatever is a little bit like kind of connected to the Mike, Mike's kind of the sort of paradox, the white panther paradox where it's like, yeah, I'm into this thing, but then these are hippies and Iggy. I never even talked about Iggy. Maybe that's why I still have all this time. <laughs> I was going to try to do that. Anyway, I, that was a long-winded kind of answer, but...
Nobody. Is Uncle Socks here? <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> okay. Um, Jonathan. Sorry. <laughs> One of my students. Jonathan Butt taught me how to use PowerPoint. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you, Jonathan. <laughs> what? Okay, yeah, so, you know, you're free, you're free to go, and, um, <laughs> thank you.